Um, so thank you to Kathleen Bennett, um, who is here with us tonight, who is the chairperson of Montclair Township's Historic Preservation Commission, um, speaking here with us tonight on the history of the Lackawanna train station. Um, so people actually are often um, unsure of the difference between the Montclair History Center and the Montclair Historic Preservation Commission. So I'm just going to take a moment to explain that difference um, for those who may be new to us or, or to Montclair who's unaware. Uh, so the History Center, we are actually a private 501c3 organization, um, and our mission is to preserve, educate, and share Montclair's history. Um, our staff are comprised of museum and education professionals, um, so we are not a part of the township, nor are we supported by the Montclair Township's government. Hence, um, all the times we ask you to kindly donate at our History at Homes, um, as such that um, those donations support our ongoing programming efforts. Um, the Montclair Historic Preservation Commission is a body of the Township of Montclair. Um, and it also operates in accordance with the state's municipal land use law. So members are appointed by the mayor. The HPC is responsible for helping to protect Montclair's architectural heritage. Um, so they have an educational role um, for the community at large, as well as the responsibility to advise the planning board and the township cattles um, council on matters such as developments um, that have potential impact on historic buildings and districts. Um, so Kathleen's presentation, um, is obviously very timely given a lot of the discussions that are happening regarding the redevelopment in Lackawanna train station. Um, so we really look forward to um, Kathleen sharing this presentation, which she actually did a number of years ago, although I'm sure there's even more new history that we're going to learn about tonight regarding Lackawanna train station. Um, so please just know that our sponsorship of this presentation should not be interpreted as an endorsement of the proposed development or the opinion of any town commission or board that is connected with reviewing um, the development plans. So tonight, really, our role is just as an educational platform. Um, and with our history at home programs and structure, it's really to make um, the site's history readily available to the community at large, like yourself, um, so that as individuals, we can take this historical information um, and contemporary reporting and really consider that when forming our own opinions on what is happening currently in Montclair Township. Um, so we really all um, here at the Montclair History Center want to see a very thoughtful design and smart adaptive reuse of this important historic site uh, because it's so integral in the role in the neighborhood and the township communities far into, you know, into the future. So also on behalf of Kathleen, my last little note before I hand it off um, is that I will be placing into the chat two links um, regarding the land board's recommendations to township council regarding the current redevelopment plan. So that is outside the scope of this presentation tonight, but should you like that current information, I will post it in the chat so you have it available. So with that, I am turning it over to Kathleen. Thank you for that introduction, Angelica. I appreciate it. And um, as Angelica said, I did do this talk, uh, now it's six years ago, when there was another development plan in the works for Lackawanna. That did not go through. We're in the process of looking at another redevelopment plan. But tonight, it's really an occasion just to look at the history of it. Uh, look at the history of the site, look at the history of the building, um, very briefly about the railroad, because I am certainly not a railroad expert, and they really get into it very deeply. Um, like I said, the architect and really just what, where it is in Montclair and how it really helped Montclair develop from this very, you know, agricultural town to a uh, thriving suburb with thousands of commuters traveling back and forth between Montclair and New York City. So uh, with that, I shall start. Uh, this is a, a vintage postcard that is in the Montclair History Center's collection. And it shows you the finished product when it was completed in 1913. That would be the waiting room um, and then the train platforms to, that come off the right. And it's amazing that we still have that central structure with us uh, today. And it's actually in pretty good shape. So June 28th, 1913 dawned sunny and clear in Montclair. It was an auspicious day of celebration as the entire community turned out to commemorate the opening of the Lackawanna Railroad, Railroad Terminal. Oh no, I can't, uh-oh, I can't advance it. Try hitting just on your key. Oh, there you go. Okay. Okay. Um, School children lined the processional route waving flags as an automobile parade wound through the streets before an extravagant luncheon at the Hotel Montclair, which included caviar, turtle soup, filet mignon, 
French ice cream finish, finishing with Cuban cigars. This event is memorialized in the commemorative booklet distributed to each dignitary, which you see on the screen. And it's interesting to note this image of the train station, which we saw just previous. Um, it's basically the same image, but here you see it juxtaposed to First Mountain and Second Mountain. And then also with the addition of the little autom automobiles and the train in the background, which you really don't see, but you know that it's there because of the puff of, of smoke. Uh, the railroad system played an important vital part in the development of the township with various permutation over the years. In addition to transporting thousands of commuters back and forth to New York every year, the Montclair terminal did a substantial business in freight, which was very important, especially for Montclair with all the building that was going on. And we also had an industrial area. Um, right here, you can see, this is from the Mueller Atlas of Essex County, 1906. This is when the second train station, the uh, Delaware, Lackawanna and Western came out of Hoboken heading west crossing Grove Street. And you can see that there's a number of sidings. Here's the roundhouse where the engines would go after they were pulled in and another engine would uh, connect to a train and pull it out because this was the terminus. You also see um, Tony's Brook here, which comes from the north and goes directly right over the, um, the center of the railroad station. Now this is in 1906. And uh, this is a broader view of the train where you see the, the Delaware coming here with all the little spider webs, veins of all the different sidings. And then over here, you have the Erie Lackawanna, which is the Greenwood Lake um, line that is a little bit later. It started in the 1870s, but this was done in a much more um, I'd say orderly fashion, which which with a double track. And then when you get up to here, which is currently the uh, uh, station at Walnut Street, this was, oops, sorry, that was that was a um, it, area of light industry, especially with the Label Street uh, 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 companies and all the other paper companies over there. So this is a map from 1906. We've already got the uh, Greenwood Lake line organized and the uh, Montclair, Delaware with the Lackawanna station is still to be realized. So we have the, um, what, what we're actually looking at today is the third terminal of the Lackawanna. The first terminal, the first Lackawanna terminal in Montclair was really a haphazard, um, as I said before, mishmash of train tracks, sheds. Um, it was noted in the paper that uh, it was it was more like a, a cow sheds on on uh, that line the, the uh, streets. And over here, you could see the roundhouse, uh, the start of the roundhouse, where the engines would be pulled up so that they could be disconnected from the trains. And then, as the trains turned around. The second version of the Lackawanna Terminal and Yard was a Victorian affair of brick. You could see it here, very high roofs, chimney, tapestry brick. This, this building is here. It's not really quite as big, but um, you can see the uh, tracks coming out, radiating to the east. Over here, we have the Crawford Block, which was built in the 1890s. That's a very old building. And here we have the Borden um, carriages lined up for milk. The Borden milk transfer station was very close by. And now we have the third terminal, which was built, finished, completed in 1913. And basically it's, it's in the same direction. The, uh, here's the waiting room. Here's the tracks, the, the, sh the uh, sheds, uh, the uh, train sheds are here. And then you can see over here is the Crawford building again. So um, the idea of improving the environment adjacent to railroad tracks and stations became popular in the first century, uh, first decade of the 20th century. 
Montclair particularly was very conscious of the unsightly aspects of the railroad, as evidenced in this article written for the American City by Montclair resident Mark Terrell. He says that a visitor approaching the town by either the Lackawanna or the Erie Railroad get a very unpleasant and on the whole erroneous impression of the suburb and alighting at either station find the building and surroundings unsightly, inconvenient and inappropriate. More than 1,500 passengers use this branch terminal of the Lackawanna Railroad each day, and both railroads should prove, provide modern stations with orderly and beautiful approaches. If the railroad should make such a suitable provision for serving a largely increasing population and attracting strangers to the town by approaches harmonious with the general atmosphere, the town should secure and develop open spaces near the train stations. Montclair, with this socially conscious, financially secure, and civic-minded residents, was well aware of contemporary planning issues dealing with the urban and the suburban. Another magazine article entitled Montclair the Beautiful appeared in Suburban Life of 1907, and it lauded the town for its prevailing note of comfort and convenience, that there was something missing. Not only were the roads illogically placed with its main thoroughfare clogged with trolleys, horse wagons, and pedestrians, but its railroad stations and their surround yards were considered unattractive and dangerous. And when I was doing research for this talk, I found an article that um, uh, mentioned an accident be, uh, between a trolley and a train. And it went into detail that the trolley was filled with children. And it was just at that point that they decided it was, a, it was time that Montclair should really uh, clean up its act in terms of the crossings, especially down at Bloomfield Avenue. Blessed with varied topography, proximity, and transportation to New York with the socially minded citizenry of educated bankers, industrious, and clergy, Montclair sprang into action. The Montclair Civic Association was charged with the selection and engagement of a landscape architect. After careful investigation, they decided upon Mr. John Nolan of Cambridge, Massachusetts, as the man best qualified by training and a special experience in residential suburbs similar to Montclair. John Nolan's report evaluated Montclair's resources, climate, and scenery. He outlined a brief appraisal of the existing facilities necessary for town life and proceeded to outline a plan which would secure additional features to add to the aesthetic and practical qualities of life in Montclair. This plan, known as the Nolan Plan, is considered the first master plan of the township. Nolan's first proposal was railroad stations and their surrounding areas must be improved in terms of safety and appearance. The Delaware and the, the Delaware area and Western wanted the terminus at Montclair to be upgraded and work was begun in 1910 with much publicity. And here you can see that they were already uh, advertising what was going to be here before it, it opened. And it seemed as though the work progressed very quickly. Uh, you can see from the, the uh, outline of down on the bottom, the proposed four plan which was for the waiting room and the uh, to, and selling tickets, it's still pretty much in existence today. Uh, over here we see construction actually going on. This is published in the, in the Montclair Times in 1912. And you can get a sense of what was going on, what would they were what they had started already. They had elevated Grove Street to accommodate the engines coming in from the east. Here we have the staircase, the balustrade, the two pillars, these, th this exists today. Um, and then they started on the construction of the, the building itself. Here we see the iron, um, you know, the iron struts to put for the roofing. And it's a combination of still using horse-drawn carriages and also uh, automobiles. But it was very much a work site at this time, which is 1912 less than a year away from opening of the, um, of the uh, station. Here we see a few months hence, further on, we can see this is the north side of the, of the track. We see the stanchions are already in place, um, but the roofs are not on yet. Here we have the balustrade over the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, bridge to go underneath where the trains uh, travel. And here we see a steam engine coming in. 
Um, so steam and coal-fired steam was very much in evidence uh, at the time. That that's what this this uh, terminal terminus was uh, planned for. And I just wanted to show the picture of this on the bottom. This is a picture. My grandfather was actually an engineer on the one of the steam trains and. That's a picture we have that's in the family. I thought it would be interesting. He actually worked on the Erie. He worked on the freight though. He did not come into um, the commuter line uh, in Lackawanna. But here we have the um, opening, the grand opening of the Lackawanna station, June 29th, 1913. The New York Times have commented on the festivities and the speeches with the heading, Montclair Joyous and New Terminal. The mayor of the time addressed his remarks to the um, W. Troonsdale, who was the official of the Lackawanna. In a short time, we shall be able to reach the metropolis from the station in 30 minutes. Surely this is bringing the great city near to our door and will appeal to a many uh, city businessman who longs to spend his nights in comfortable quiet while he breathes the invigorating atmosphere of our mountain altitude. And here you see the man himself, the uh, mayor on the right, and the uh, official from the uh, Lackawanna on the, on the left. Now, Mr. Truesdale was presented with this certificate, which was uh, a beautiful calligraphy, calligraphy certificate, which up six years ago was still in existence, and it was in the foyer of the Pig, Pig and Prince. And um, it has to be somewhere still, but it's an absolutely beautiful, very large uh, certificate uh, calligraphied with, um, you know, symbols, and it, it it really is quite beautiful. It was done by the um, the calligrapher studio in New York by the name of Ames and Rowlandson, and it was one. Of, it was the oldest calligraphy studio in the country at the time. So, for once, township officials seemed to be in agreement, as this quote from the Montclair Times of June seventh, nineteen seventeen, says. Not in the history of Montclair has there been a more enthusiastic set sentiment than that shown in the meeting held in the new municipal building on Thursday evening to decide on the plans for the celebration of the opening of the new Lackawanna Depot and to, commem to commemorate the completion of the terminal improvements. And you could see that this is the, um, the, the uh, brochure that I showed before, and it was actually stamped with a, a um, at wax and you can see it has Montclair, New Jersey in the symbol. This is also in the collection of the Montclair History Center. So noticeably absent from the festivities was the man who designed the handsomest and best arranged suburban railroad terminal in the United States, according to the Montclair Times of June 28th. That young man, William Hull Botsford, died in the Titanic tragedy on April 15th, 1912, and his Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western mentor and colleague, F.J. Nice, chief architect of the project, took his place on the stage. William Hull Botsworth, born in Bingham, New York in 1886, led an exemplary life at Cornell where he enrolled in the architectural program. He actually, he graduated in 1908. He excelled in, in wrestling, designed the cover of the Cornell yearbook, and experimented with the relatively new hobby of photography. You can see from these examples of his work at Cornell that uh, he, he had a good sense of design, proportion, and knowledge of the various styles of architecture, especially the Beaux-Arts style, which he demonstrated in these drawings. Prior to his Cornell career, Botsworth spent two years working for the architectural firm of Pierce, Pierce and Bickford, architects in Elmira, New York, and they were pioneers in the use of concrete and building, building materials. William uh, Hull Botsford was hired by the Delaware, Lackawanna and Western and went to work at the Hoboken office of Frank J. Nice, chief architect for the company. The company operated under great social pressure to spru spruce up their railroad yards and terminals in the most economical way possible. It was considered it was the consideration of reduced costs that led the railroads and other concerns interested in great engineering works to develop the use of concrete and massive construction. 
The materials for concrete as opposed to the use of brick, which, which brick had to be transported and, and so that added to the cost. And concrete was very cheap because it could be, it could actually be manufactured right on site. And the aggregate uh, needed for concrete mixture was usually found on the excavation site of the building or near it. As cement is manufactured in many centers and its weight comprises a small fraction of the total, the cost of, tra of transportation, especially in comparison to brick, is, common, is comparatively smaller. The mixing and assembly of concrete pieces is efficient, quick, quickly and done easily by the combined efforts of machinery and cheap labor under skilled supervision. So here you could see um, the, the cement mixing machines uh, being uh, used at the Lackawanna site. And over on the right, I thought this was very interesting. There was a picture in the Montclair Times from 1910, and it was a, the title of it was Italian immigrant women were clearing the site. So they're actually carrying the debris off the work site on their heads and carrying it off the, the work site. It all had to be leveled. This is all really done by, by hand. Um, and the picture up here shows the, the workmen still uh, putting up the tile roof on the, um, the, the train end section the terminal section. The Delaware um, and Western embrace cement con construction technology and Botsworth with his previous experience at the architectural firm of Pearson Bickford, soon became a chief engineer, chief, in chief and engineer and designer. Uh, the railroad embarked on rebuilding their stations in New Jersey and Botsworth designed many of these suburban stations, including Bloomfield, which is here, uh, Wassinging, Short Hills, Lake Apocon, Basking Ridge, and, and Morristown. In addition, here's responsible. Here's some, um, some others that were actually um, shown in, the, in a uh, magazine of, of the time. So this is Utica Station. This is Apocon, Lake Apocon. And this is the other Utica station. But you could see for the at the time, they were it was very avant-garde in, in design. Um, here we have the Blairstown station that he had a hand in, and I think this is the Blairstown station too. But in addition, he was also responsible as one of the engineers, although he didn't live to see it, um, for the 2,300-foot railroad viaduct between Binghamton and Scranton, known as the Tukunka Viaduct or the Nicholson Bridge. Rising above the river and valley to a height of a 20-story building, it's also called the largest concrete bridge in the world, with a rope that is 100 feet higher than the tallest point of the Brooklyn Bridge. Ironically, notice of the acceptance of Botsford's design for this viaduct was delivered to London a few days after he departed England on the Titanic. And we must remember that this remarkable body of work was accomplished by a man who perished when he was only 28 years old. For most of the time he worked for the railroad, Mr. Botsford lived at, in Orange, New Jersey at the YMCA while working at the Hoboken office. And of course he was um, coming to Montclair uh, to uh, start the, see, uh, supervise the construction on that site. According to his journals, which are in the archives of Cornell University, he started work on the, on the Bloomfield, Blairstown, Montclair, Marstown, and Utica, Lackawanna stations in 1910. He also managed to teach architectural and mechanical drawing in a night school course at the Y in, in the Oranges. He authored an article in January 11th uh, edition of the Cement Age, entitled the Concrete Passenger Station. He discussed concrete as a building material and used the Bloomfield, New Jersey Railroad Station, which he designed as an example of progressive design combined with cutting edge technology. This site with its dramatic, here it is right here, with its dramatic uh, grade differences provided a challenge and provide in, in uh, it, it provided a challenge in its grade difference. It included terrace, carriage drive to, to convey the impression of a village gateway, waiting room, baggage room, cantilevered canopy, ticket office, newsstand and toilets, uh, all of in an upscale suburban train station. 
he used the he handled this by using plain and reinforced concrete in nearly the entire structure. The editors of Cement Age made a plea that concrete be used as an artistic treatment that need not be molded in imitation of any other building material, nor has it to be covered with any veneer. This quality of concrete is slowly but surely becoming recognized by some of the best designers. Botsford handled the surface treatment of the concrete with different finishes. These techniques included patent hammering, tool chiseling, bush hammering, and fine pointing. As you can see, the simple shapes combined with these specific concrete finishing techniques create a structure which relies on shadow and sun to create an ever-changing facade. So he also managed to accomplish other architectural work while he was doing work for the, for the Erie. He designed, he entered a competition for the YMCA and Summit, which was not accepted. This was his, his design, and this is what was built. He, uh, he also uh, had a design for the Penn Street Bridge across the Schuylkill River in Reading, which was accepted. And you can see the balustrade is very similar to the, um, to the bridge over uh, Grove Street. And he designed the, the house of Frank Nyes over uh, his office superior, which I believe is in, in um, Glen Ridge. I haven't quite found it yet. But this period of almost frenzied activity corresponds with Botsford's optimism and is duly noted in his journals. One of his entries dated February 23rd, 1910, just two years before the, the, the uh, Titanic disaster reads, the history of architecture is a record of man's efforts to build beautifully. The execution of structures devoid of beauty is mere building, a trade and not an art. Edifices in which strength and stability alone have been sought in designing with only utilitarian consideration of properly works of engineering. Only when the ideas of beauty are added to that pursuit of use does the structure take its place among works of architecture. We may then define architecture as the art that seeks to harmonize in the building the requirements of beauty and utility. It becomes the highest of fine art and the noblest of the useful gifts. It touches the life of man at every point. And his journals are in the uh, Cornell University Library, which I was very lucky to get to uh, six years ago, right before COVID hit. So shortly after this entry, Botsford took a leave of absence from the Lackawanna Architectural Department. He had been granted a raise to $140 a month, $45,000 annual salary in today's currency, and quickly applied for a passport. He boarded the Kaiser August Victoria of the Hamburg uh, American Line in Hoboken on February, 4, February 11th, 1912. This leave gave him the opportunity to travel to Italy, France, Greece, Egypt, Turkey, Algiers, and finally England to study building and, and, and uh, construction techniques, a grand tour. This is his postcard album compiled by his family in Myra as he was sending postcards back from his travels. And it shows his recognition of these unforgivable, unforgettable sites. Botsford boarded the Titanic at Southampton with a second class ticket in April 10, on April 10th, 1912. His ill-fated voyage cut short a promising life and career. This cartoon drawn by a work card colleague in memorial shows a mourning a friend and a colleague. And this was a colleague at the, uh, at the, uh, at the Lackawanna in Hoboken. So you could see that they obviously held him in, in some regard, also with, with a sense of humor. Um, the Montclair Lackawanna station was the last station designed by Botsford, but it appears that the railroad officials, officials considered it his best to date. An article in the Railroad Employee published in Newark and dated June 11, 1911, calls the Montclair, Bloomfield, and Washington stations the station palatial and describes how these stations will be added to the list of the most beautiful, costly, and up-to-date railroad passenger stations in the world. All designed by Botsford, they use concrete in different applications. Montclair is described as Grecian Doric, colonnaded order, simple and dignified, and is proposed to execute the design in the latest product of the brickmaker's art known as tapestry brick with Roman stone embellishments. 
The whole, when completed, will give Montclair a passenger terminal which, for size, beauty, and convenience, would meet her needs for a great many years to come, all of which her citizens might be very proud. The Lackawanna completed the passenger freight terminals at Montclair with an expenditure of almost $500,000. And that would be uh, that would be over $12 million today when adjusted for uh, the year, 100 years of inflation. The work was designed and executed in the finest materials with the view of serving the community and commuters with pride and efficiency. The township was charged with was charged with uh, building and improving the roads and approaches and also the landscaping that led to the tracks. The Railroad Gazette of July 4th, 1913, describes the exterior and interior of the Montclair Lackawanna terminal as such. The station is built in the Grecian, Grecian Doric style of architecture architectural opening through a colonnade into a loggia leading directly to the main waiting room and tra train concourse. The walls are faced with tapestried brick trimmed with marble chip concrete. The roof over the main waiting room is of green glazed tiles, while over the lower portion of the building it is of red quarried tile, the same material used for the floor of the loggia. The walls of the main waiting room are faced with buff colored pressed brick broken with pilasters and a molded, brick, a molded belt course 16 feet above the floor line. This belt course and the molded bricks around the large semicircular arched windows at each end of the main waiting room and they are gray in color. The floor is of marble chip terrazzo harmonizing in color with the walls. The original blueprints are in the Cornell Library where you can see Botsford's informal signature bots uh, on, the, on them. While he certainly was responsible for the exterior design, as the architect, he made the decisions for the interior appointments as well, such as the Rickwood, this here, the Rickwood uh, drinking fountain, the bronze cast uh, race clock set in the wall, the Flemish uh, bond brick designs, and the Vitruvian wave floor design, um, mosaic border on the terrazzo floor. On the exterior, the combination of brick and concrete made for a subtle expression of affluence, as one realizes that the Lackawanna went to the extreme expense of providing brick as opposed to concrete for the entire building, such as that that was used in the Bloomfield Station. Montclair presented an imposing location with major sight lines to the broadest and busiest street in the township. In fact, Botsford's journal entry of November 10, 1910, records that Montclair is drawn is too small for the Montclair people and plans for a larger waiting room and train platform is commencing. So Montclair's leveraging for a larger terminal worked in township's favor, and that is what we see now. On careful examination, one can appreciate the subtlety involved in the juxtaposition of the concrete and brick. But close up, the concrete chip, the marble chip concrete has flecks of green, which echo the green tiles of the roof. These are Brookville tiles, the same tiles used on the Plaza Hotel and other major buildings of the era. This type of marble aggregate mixed with the concrete would have had to been specially mixed from a stone not associated with the site. It would have incurred an additional expense for the construction, something that the Lackawanna officials provided for the Montclair terminal. Um, the article from the American architect architect published after his death, but certainly written by him, uh, describes a technique used in the concrete construction of the terminal, of the Montclair terminal. It says possibly even more interesting examples of the use of concrete in conventional forms are illustrating the station of Montclair. The bricks are the walls are of brick. The trimmings are not stone as one might guess at first, but concrete blocks. Yet there is no intended or ultimate deception for closer inspection reveals a surface that in no way resembles any generally used building stone, but is appropriate to the concrete, to the nature of concrete. The mason having, having the care of this part of the work was formerly a worker in ornamental plaster. For all of this work, therefore, he followed the methods of that craft and of the shop cast his ornamental concrete bricks in gelatin molds. This made it possible to attain greater delicacy and accuracy in detail that would be feasible with less plastic molds of wood. And you can see the details appear underneath the cornice. 
After the concrete had set, but was not yet green, it was taken from the mold and the surface uh, film of concrete removed by brushing with a wet broom. Thus the aggregate consisting of yellow uh, bank sand and various uh, marbles of a very colored marble of specific size was exposed revealing a surface of warm, rich color, somewhat resembling a terrazzo. Experimenters in this country and abroad have used various pigments for coloring concrete, but many of them fade and are unsatisfactory. By introducing color through the medium of successfully selected aggregate, however, uh, that this permanency is assured and the ultimate effect is not entirely a matter of accident or good fortune. And if you've ever had the um, good fortune to be down by the terminal just after it rains and while this is wet, the green flecks really show as in, the pic as in this picture here. It's really quite a, a beautiful contrast. Um, another, uh, Okay, here. At what greater compliment to be compared than to one of the great iconic symbols of neoclassical building in the U.S., but McKim Mina White's Pennsylvania Station, sadly no longer with us, but very much in the mind of a young architect in 1910. And I want to thank my former colleague on the HPC, David Greenbaum, for the image uh, that he uh, sent to me. After Botsworth's death, a memorial window was placed in the station and a local newspaper wrote, this window will stand as an enduring monument to the genius of its brilliant young designer who went down with other brave men and women on the ill-fated Titanic. A New York Times article from the 1980s also mentions a memorial stone. The whereabouts of these two memorials is unknown, but it could be an interesting angle to bring public interest to the site. Uh, just maybe as somebody in your uh, audience tonight knows what happens to the Botsworth window. In 1913, the lines were electrified that went into the Montclair terminal as steam was considered too dirty to, and uh, to run, especially through the uh, burgeoning suburbs. And here we see, uh, um, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Edison, Thomas Edison was on the run. He was at the controls that went from Hoboken to Montclair. And you can see Mr. Truesdale in 1913 was still around. He was still on the um, on the board, uh, the president of the Lackawanna, still living in um, Glenridge. And so the story continues. By the late 1960s, with a series of ownership mergers, service to New York City was reduced. Plans were advanced to realign the Montclair branch with the Erie, Green, the Erie Greenwood Lake line. At this time, the Lackawanna Terminal came under attack from the herbal renewal, renewal scheme, which played the country. It was based on the total clearance concept. It proposed tearing down everything and offering the developer empty land. This predated the adaptive reuse concept uh, advocated by today's preservationists and develop, redevelopment standards. Fortunately for Montclair, private citizens and the Montclair Historical Society at that time rallied to serve the buildings on the Lackawanna site. The site was placed on the National and State Historic Registers at the time in 1972 and 1973, respectively. In 2003, the site became an integral part of the expanded downtown local historic district. And you could see here from the plan that was uh, proposed in the 1970s, that this whole area here, this would have been where the tracks were. This is all uh, planned to be demolished until these people from Montclair Historical Society stepped forward, Marjorie Crane and also Jack Chance, at the, um, there's a bronze plaque on the side of the waiting room now, uh, 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 thanking them, basically. Uh, and also in the 1970s, on the 60th birthday party, to celebrate the induction into the, um, into the, uh, on the state register, the Montclair Historical held a birthday party at the, uh, at the train station. The tra I have to say the train station also was part of the, um, held a antique shop that was run by the Montclair Historical Society. So uh, the plans were uh, advanced to align the Montclair branch with the Erie Greenwood line. And that would go, they would 
take it to the east side of Grove Street, making the original Lackawanna canopies and train sheds obsolete. The last train operated out of the original Lackawanna station in 1981. By February 21st, the move to the new station on Bay Street was completed. In 1984, another urban renewal project uh, revitalized the original Lackawanna Railroad Station. This one retained many of the historic components, such as the historic waiting room, the beam supply uh, supporting the train sheds, one side of the Grove Street staircase, a horse trough, and open space boarding on Bluefield Avenue. Planned by Montclair Center Associates, it supported a shopping mall, which you can see here, and also a past mark supermarket with surrounding residential and commercial amenities. At that time, the Department of Interior undertook a photographic survey of the Grove Street Bridge and its existing structures. You could see what still survives today. But there is a question about the retention of the platform canopies of the train sheds. Oops, sorry. In um, Jack Chance, one of the people that was responsible for saving uh, the, the uh, train sheds, said that the, um, wrote to the director of the Montclair Redevelopment Agency, the National Register listing of the Lackawanna station includes the entire station complex, including the platform canopies. I feel assured there will be an asset to the township regardless of which developer is water the project. There are three main reasons that the station was considered to be qualified for the National Register. One was its architectural significance, including the overall design. Um, Another factor was the importance of the architect, William Hull Botsford, a genius who lost his life at age 26 in the Titanic. And finally, the station is considered significant because of its importance as a transportation center in the history of the township. This is where the canopies must be considered. If the railroad is to be preserved because of its significance as a railroad station, Every effort must be made to retain its appearance as a railroad station, and by this I mean a station with some semblance of railroad platforms. One plan retains the whole feel of an active railroad station in a booming town, which indeed it was in 1913 when it was completed. The station building without the canopies not only loses that essence, that essence it looks naked. Its overall appearance is distort, distorted and no longer has the qualities of a railroad station, which the National Register described and which is indeed is intended to preserve. So today this site is known as the Montclair Railroad Station, the Delaware Lackawanna and Western site. It was placed on the National Register in, in 1973 the New Jersey Register of Historic Places in 1972 and exists within the Town Historic District. It was placed in the, in the uh, Town Historic District expansion in 2003. The, the site is a, considered a key building within this district. Designation, this designation, designation identifies it as a building which possesses a, a direct architectural and historical significance and which acts as a landmark within the architectural matrix of the, of the district. As stated in Montclair Code 347-135A, the Montclair Railroad Station satisfied four of the five criteria deemed necessary for local landmark listing. As a local landmark, the Montclair Historic Preservation Commission considers the site to be worthy of its former of its designation. It considers the building structures, objects, and site of integrity of location, setting, materials, workmanship, feeling, and association. So the Lackawanna Plaza um, is a site. This is the, I uh, just wanted to show after the last go around with the developer six years ago, the state um, updated their Argus online viewfinder and they now consider the entire area here, even over in which no longer exists. This is the parking lot. This to be the entire historic site. So um, the surviving historic fabric, which is to the west of Grove Street, remaining within the site of the former Lackawanna Station must be safe and celebrated as highly significant to the development of Montclair. This site uh, incorporates an outstanding building and adjacent structures, the architectural genius of a promising architect, comparison one of the greatest tragedies of the era, 
and is the site which heralds the arrival of the railroad in Montclair. And the railroad is very important. Uh, in fact, the state has just recognized that, the state of New Jersey, and they're actually making a big push this year as for railroading and, and um, identifying sites within the state that can uh, have uh, are eligible for grants to uh, find out a little bit more of, of uh, what happened in these sites during the, that time. And all of these factors created a transformation of the Montclair community from an agricultural society into a commuter suburb. It is the reason we are the Montclair of today. And I also like to point out that um, we had also, you know, really gave much to not only transportation to the township, but also provided many jobs to uh, the township from, uh, from uh, you know, uh, baggage handlers, engineers, um, newspaper sellers, uh, not only a, a, it was a real center of communication and commu commuters. So with that, I'd like to thank you, thank the Montclair History Center for all the help that they provided. The Montclair Public Library has a great resource. The Cornell Library has all of Botsford's um, papers. It's really incredible. Uh, you know, the, the, his uh, blueprints, but what I showed you, the journal, um, his uh, even his postcard uh, journal that he sent back to his uh, his family, and then this Steamtown Museum, which is actually in Scranton. They have they were the, they were the uh, source of the glass slides that I showed on the screen that were very important. So, with that, I'd like to say thank you. And if there's any questions, I'll try to answer them. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Always informative. I don't know if you know, and I popped it in the chat as questions are being um, considered. We digitized, um, had part of a film digitized, which is a 1920 and 1930s clip, clip that shows the Lackawanna train station. It's on our YouTube oh. channel. And I didn't, it didn't, I didn't even click in my mind. Um, so I put that in the chat, but I will also email that to you um, later on. So you can take a look at it. You can't show it now, can you? <laughs> Can you I find actually, it? I, I might be able to, but well, how about we do questions first and let's see if I can get oh, okay. the video I'll out, try so. to, Okay. Yeah. Any questions, feel free to unmute or use the chat if anyone has anything they'd like to ask. Thanks, Kathleen. I loved your, um, I love seeing his, uh, the pages from his journal from the Cornell Library. That was real. I don't, I didn't remember seeing that at the last time you presented this. Um, that was really um, special. And the fact that he was such a local guy, you know, living in the Oranges and commuting to Montclair, Hoboken. I mean, even though he was born in upstate New York, I think he had a real feel for this area. Seems to. I do have the video up if you want me to screen share and play it quickly while we're chatting. It's, 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 yes. there's no sound, it's just image. So, sure. It means I have to just stop your screen share, Kathleen. So that's going to happen. Yes. So hang on. Let's see if I can. Can you see my screen okay? Yes. So this is up on our YouTube channel, which is was part of um, funding we got to digitize some films in our collection. And this happens to be one of the Lackawanna Tournament. It's kind of small. What was Didn't that? Stop. Oh, it shouldn't have. Hold on. What year is this? Oh, it says my screen sharing is paused. Hold on. Let me figure out why. <laughs> 1920s and 30s, approximately. I'm going to try sharing it again. Hold on. And just see. It looks like it's a steam engine. It's not, a, it's not an electric engine. So it must have been. So it would have been that. the twenties. Yeah. Is it not working this share? It's not showing right now. Oh God, because I I'm keep hitting resume share and it won't let me do it. So I don't know why that is. My apologies, but uh, I did put that link in the chat for for everyone if you want to take a look at that. Oh, it was very interesting. Just having that two seconds was really, really. <laughs> I'll make sure I know that to you I right now. To <laughs> yeah, I would have tried to have put it in because I think it's very important. Could you really see? I mean, 
you know, buildings are great. I love the construction techniques. I love the ingenuity, but it's really the people that populate these buildings that make it, uh, you know, important and why we should try to save them. That's how, what I, how I feel. <laughs> of course. I mean, Kathleen, in, speaking of saving, the images that you showed of the interior of the station uh, when the Pig and Prince was operating showed a really remarkable uh, water fountain and mm. wall clock. Are those still in existence, even though the, you know, the, the area has been sealed shut? Well, interestingly, there isn't a uh, operating restaurant there now. I would I was fortunate to get in about, I don't know, maybe three weeks ago. And um, the fountain is still there. What the clock on the wall had been pried off the wall uh, after the pig and prince closed, but it's been returned. I think it was somebody had found it locally. And what I what the uh, proprietor told me that it has been returned. Um, what else was there? Uh, I guess that was it. Uh, you know, you could still see the floor is in good shape. Uh, the the uh, the the wall sconces are the originals, not the center uh, uh, chandelier, but the wall sconces are still there. So yes. There is a lot that's still original to the building. And then the one picture I showed with, uh, which had the um, enclosed mall that was done in the 1980s, those are current photographs from like three weeks ago. So that interior mall is in very good shape. Those stanchions are in excellent shape. And Kathleen, the journal that you showed the front, the first page of and other documents by, uh, the architect, are they online? Does the Cornell Library have them accessible no. online? No. no, I visited. I went up for a day and visited and 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 looked at, uh, they had three huge boxes. Uh, no, uh, you know, maybe then we had COVID. I couldn't get back. I tried to get back like two weeks ago, but all these libraries now have more, have stricter, um, regulations in terms of how many people could come how uh, at one time I always they always had that but it was a little bit more open you didn't need you know a week or two in advance to make um to make a uh, uh, uh an appointment uh, but your your question is a good one and if you wanted to look more perhaps you could call there and ask a librarian to do some research meaning you know they would take it out and look through it or just that front page that you showed all of us um I, you know it seemed like a really terrific write-up by by him and uh you know is there any way we can get a copy of at least that front page well i'd share journal? it with you that i have that i that i took i i have that mm -hmm. definitely yeah sure or of course send it to the montclair history center yeah, i'll send it, it to montclair Horn. history yeah. Yes, yeah. of course yes and my last oh my last question i'm sorry uh any theories on where the memorial window or windows are? I would love to find out where that is. Uh, that would be great. I think we should do a, have a, like a, 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 a cert, you know, like a treasure hunt and see if we can put it out there and ask anybody. No, I've, I've tr even six years ago, I tried to find and I couldn't find, no, not at all. Not even an image of it, which is unusual. Um, I thought that at least there'd be an image somewhere. And I just, you know, I'm just surmising it was in one of the smaller win windows that um, are on the, the, you know, the, the, the colonnade side, not, not uh, that you could actually see it from the, the street. But I don't know, Mark, I really don't know. Yeah, thank you. So Angelica, any thoughts on, um, the window, you haven't heard anything. Nobody's not, come for how I'm aware of. Um, if anything <laughs> comes forward, I'll let you know. I just want you to know you've gotten a lot of these comments in the chat. Um, Mike Del Vecchio just made a note from the discussion about what is still there that the fountain is there and that the clock is currently being restored. Just wanted to relay mm -hmm. that. Um, if anyone else has questions, feel free to unmute or just use the chat and if you'd like to. What's really interesting uh, is the um, Jack Chance, who was one of the 
uh, uh, you know, the people that were really responsible for saving what, what we still have. Um, he went to Cornell. So I had the good fortune to know Mr. Chance years ago, and um, he he was so impressed with Botsford's genius that he had copies made of the blueprints, which are now in the collection of the Montclair History Center. So, and I guess at the time in the 1980s, although I I wasn't I didn't see it um, there, I I would imagine there was a, um, a you know some type of exhibition or they were. Just you know, exhibit it somehow. I, I I don't know. They're in they're in delicate shape now, but they are copies of the originals that that are up in Cornell. Thank you, Kathleen, for sharing that. Well, if there are no more questions, but if there are, jump in. I just want to say thank you, Kathleen, for an informative presentation. Um, and I did post just before if you missed part of the presentation. We always record all of our history at homes so that goes up on our YouTube channel. Our YouTube channel is also where that film is, that 1920s, 1930 film for Lackawanna Terminal, um, which I'm gonna, again, just a uh, quick- Try this unusual, but- Sorry for that noise. I'm gonna quickly throw out a link um, again to take you there. I was just trying to do a quick copy and paste. Um, so please check out our next history at home. I just want to make a note of that is on March 9th. That's at 7 p.m. And that will be with Rich Rockwell, who is exploring the photography of Charles Warren Eaton, who was a monk, I'm sorry, Bloomfield resident um, for some time and did quite some extensive photography in the area. Um, so thank you so much, Kathleen. And thank you all for attending and being here tonight. Possible. Yeah, was great. Can, Thank you. Can, uh, I just want to say that in the chat, it's also the the resolutions for both the uh, from the planning board and the HPC. Angelica has very kindly put up uh, where you can read those. That that now the next step will be that the council will be um, making a decision as to where to proceed with the uh, redevelopment plan. I'm just posting them again because they got a little buried. <laughs> so they're but you can find Thank them you. there. Yep. Still, still possible to add some comments? Sure. Okay, yeah, yeah I'm Mike Delvecchio. I'm a Lackawanna historian. So hmm. I uh, very much enjoyed seeing the, the Montclair version of things. Um, the, the Botsford collection is very interesting. I'm gonna pursue looking at that, but uh, Botsford did a lot of illustrating for the Lackawanna of various station projects. Um, AJ Nafee was the assistant chief engineer that implemented all of this stuff and the track arrangements. Um, one of the things about the, the Lackawanna the terminal, um, every major, Lackawanna was a huge railroad. It was uh, the first railroad listed on the Dow Jones, or what would become the Dow Jones Industrial Average. So it was a, it was a big company. Now, every major railroad in America had offices down on 50 Church Street, Cedar Street, Barclay Street, and Lower Manhattan. Um, I was flying over Montclair Terminal with a drone to document it, and I realized that the station points, the trackage points right at the world, right at the World Financial Center today. So I'm sure that was no accident. You know, because the tracks don't parallel uh, Bloomfield Avenue, but mm. with so many railroad executives working in Lower Manhattan, many of them lived in Montclair, and that's why the Lackawanna wanted to put a good wanted to put a good face on Montclair <laughs> Terminal, make it look like one of the sharpest terminals in New Jersey. Thank you, Michael. And the the uh, the electrification was in 1930. And uh, um, Trus Truesdale was retired by then, but he was invited for the uh, for the dedication, as was Thomas Edison. And Edison died shortly after the the uh, first runs of the electrics. Uh, I'm wondering about a question that I have, Trina Paulus. I live right down the street on Elm Street, and uh, what you showed here was such a vibrant center for life and it's and when i talk to other seniors about this we keep thinking about it should be again this vibrant center for life and it's a pity to make it just another one of these high-rise things like we've seen next to the wellmont um 
Do we need any more of that sort of thing? Or do we really need something that looks a little bit more like it is right now? And um, I'm just throwing that out, out here because it's hard to think about turning back the clock a little bit and taking it into the public domain in some way or another. Thank you, Trina. Hi, Trina. I don't know if you remember me, Angelica from the farm camp days at the History Center. How are you? Yes, I do remember that. Yes. Um, your comments are well received, and I'm sure Kathleen would encourage you to, you know, always bring some kind of public comment to the Historic Preservation Commission or the town council meetings. That's obviously a great avenue to express those ideas. Absolutely. I want to say now. it's great to see Mark Porter here. <laughs> we had a lot to do with each other for quite a while. <laughs> One or two articles. You, Trina. <laughs> and they, I just want to say thank you as well to Michael um, for sharing that additional Lackawanna terminal information. All very fascinating. And I'm actually surprised that the electric didn't come until 1930. I don't know why I thought it would have been earlier, but... <laughs> Um, electric uh, electric trains were just getting started in the in the 30s. Uh, the trend began in 1910, okay. but the lack of completed its electrification just to keep employees working during the depression. Got it. You know, it was it was a good uh, it was a good business move rather than lay off employees and have to rehire and retrain after the after the depression. That they would uh, they they did all that work to get it started during the depression. Makes sense, yeah. Mm -hmm. Similar with the Empire State Building and, and other big projects. It mm -hmm. was, uh, you know, there was lots of labor available, so. That's true, and wasn't the first Christmas tree electrified at Rockefeller Center around the 1930s? I think I'm getting that date right. <laughs> so it's all starting to that line up be. around the same time. <laughs> uh, great, any other thoughts or questions from the group? Uh, one one thing to note is the the, the current developer is um, in the process of restoring one of the Edison electric rail cars. He wants to restore it to pristine shape and then bring it down to the terminal and park it right on the same track one where it operated in service. Interesting fact. So, yeah. So that's in the process. That's in process now. Very interesting. 